biology is not generally a one-way street. And biology generally has two ways in the street. You can travel um, either towards uh, improving your functional status over time, or you can continually travel on the path towards increasing disability and dysfunction. Uh, and there are biological mechanisms available in our body to do either one of those. <laughs> and so to some extent, it depends on what route we want to take. And to take the route of renewal, of immune renewal, of getting rid of these scars and regenerating our immune system function, we have to do things that are probably different than what we did to get us into the problem to begin with. Dr. Bland, I am so honored to have you on the Root Cause Medicine podcast. Welcome. Well, Dr. Kerry Jones, <laughs> this is like one of the great moments in uh, my week to have the chance to really explore with you topics that we share an interest in as it relates to how we can help people achieve higher levels of health by leaving in the dustbin disease and producing outcomes called high-level living. That's yeah. what we're up to. Oh my gosh, I love that. And I, for people who don't know, Dr. Bland was part of a immune autoimmune boot camp that we did on Rupa Health in 2022. So I got to hear him quite a bit discuss new research, new literature, um, along with a lot of his experience on the on immune, and then listen to him yesterday talking about the state of sick care, unfortunately. And now this year, you know, his his goal and mission and passion, which we will talk about all around immune, and then first kicking off with a symposium on cardiometabolic health. So this is a lot of topics for people who are maybe going to make their head spin, but at the same time, you know, our listeners are really passionate about health at lifespan. You know, they, they want to get to the end lively and in good shape. And, you know, as we hear all the time, I want to be able to lift up my grandkids. I want to be able to lift my suitcase up into the, you know, the overhead bin as I'm, as I'm traveling the world at, at 92 years old. And that's, that's what we're about. That's what you're about. And that's what you teach all the time. So I'm really excited to have you on today. Well, I'm excited to be here. Let's get at it. There's lots to talk about. There is lots to talk about. Before we do get started, for those who don't, don't know, Dr. Bland is considered the godfather of functional medicine. So we'll start actually by having people just learn who you are, what you stand for, and really how you got into um, you know, the symposium we mentioned, which is the Personalized uh, uh, Lifestyle Medicine Institute, and then we'll go on from there. Yeah, thanks. So just a kind of a cliff notes version of this 77 years of living that I've had the privilege of experiencing. Um, we started the Institute for Functional Medicine in 1990. Our first uh, symposium was in 1991. And the formation of that organization was really focused on two objectives, one of which was to teach a curriculum that would translate into practice so that practitioners who were interested in root cause medicine could employ these concepts of systems biology in their practice successfully to remediate people's dysfunctions and prevent them from having more serious downstream illnesses. Uh, so that, I believe, we, over the 30 plus years since the Institute was founded, has been reasonably well accomplished. We got uh, accreditation in our fifth year, that would be back around 1996-97 from the American Co um, Continuing Medical Education Accrediting Organization, ACCME, uh, to be a Category 1 provider. And we have uh, we have fulfilled those criteria with three um, reviews by that organization to provide meritorious continuing medical education to practitioners around this concept of systems biology applied to functional health. Um, so that that's good. The other objective we had when we founded the organization was to make sure we were always bringing the newest and latest kind of cutting edge concepts into the, into practice. So that not the bleeding edge, but hopefully the kind of the leading edge <laughs> information. And it turns out that those two objectives, as we've learned over the thirty years, are a little bit mutually exclusive because the uh, accrediting body, uh, ACCME, or Category 1 accreditation, really wants things to be taught that are standard of practice in the usual and customary mode. So that really, um, to some extent, limits our ability at IFM to move out into some of the more exploratory areas that are at the leading edge uh, until they've kind of passed some degree of um, 
a, uh, I guess you call a standardization. Mm -hmm. So in order to keep alive the second objective of the IFM, I decided we needed another organization that didn't require ACCME to bring its material to audiences. And that then became the Personalized Lifestyle Medicine Institute because we are not hidebound by the criteria of ACC and accreditation. We are capable of bringing anyone that we want from any discipline to talk about new ideas and the new breakthrough concepts. And so PLMI has filled that gap for us over the last 10 years since it was founded. And I'm pleased to say that this last year, the Personalized Lifestyle Medicine Institute courses had over 35,000 attendee. So we are now, I would say, kind of a feeder organization into what ultimately becomes standards of practice within the functional medicine community. I think we're the first kind of prospectors of things that are happening on the frontier. Yeah. And so it gives me a kind of a dual identity uh, through my connection in with IFM, uh, through the teaching curriculum and accreditation and certification, and then also through the um, kind of pioneering new concepts that will help drive the continued evolution of the field. I love that. And for the listeners, um, IFM, the Institute for Functional Medicine, you know, we've directed many of you who are searching for a functional medicine provider to their search function. If you go to ifm.org, um, if we just search the Institute for Functional Medicine, it's, they have a great search directory for practitioners who do a lot of the things that Dr. Bland and I are going to talk about today. And for practitioners who are listening, we are going to talk about this symposium that's coming up in April at the end of this podcast, but I highly recommend you just go ahead and search PLMI, the Personalized Lifestyle Medicine Institute. I went to all three PLMI last year. Uh, there was one in Chicago, one in Denver, and one in Seattle. And Dr. Bland is not kidding. It is definitely cutting edge. It is researchers right out of their lab who have flown over to talk about what they're studying. Um, it is a lot of topics that are, I, I love that you said, hopefully not bleeding edge, but definitely cutting edge that have you taking a copious amount of notes, making sure you have the slides because- I know I learned a lot at all three of the PLMI, so we will touch on that at the end for the practitioners who are listening. But let's let's jump into immune to start because while I mentioned cardiometabolic, we have to start off the podcast with immune. We have seen major immune changes the last couple of years. Um, you know, you have definitely kept up on post COVID syndrome. You know, the post COVID side effects, and I know that's really concerning, really scary for a lot of people, uh, practitioner and patient alike, where they just don't understand what's happening. So I would like to just sort of jump in open-ended with what have you been reading? What have you been seeing? What is your take on this when it, when it comes to our immune system? And then of co course, overlaying COVID on top of it. Yeah, thanks uh, very much, Gary. I think this is a very, very important and top of mind subject right now. Um, you know, a lot of people, and me included, quite honestly, are kind of, quote, tired of COVID, uh, and we'd like to leave it in the rearview mirror and move on, but it won't let us do that. It sticks around and has a kind of ghost-like effect still on our culture, mm -hmm. and it is particularly seen in this long COVID or long-haul COVID condition, which now, you know, depending on who you want to listen to, what research you want to follow, uh, there is some kind of range of uh, numbers of how many people are affected. But I think conservatively, we can say that 10% of individuals who had a COVID positive diagnosis uh, end up with some form with differing degrees of severity, frequency, and duration of what's been called long COVID. And long COVID really presents itself with a myriad of different um, signs and symptoms, but the principal ones are cognitive, uh, foggy brain, confusion, sleep disturbances, behavior changes, depression, um, and respiratory uh, related to uh, issues uh, of uh, cardiovascular pulmonary function. And, and then um, neurologic as it relates to things like smell or people and taste, which often doesn't come back for many, many months. And then lastly is um, lassitude, fatigue, and uh, chronic pain. Now this constellation of symptoms, which is being experienced by millions of people now, is kind of a legacy nasty mark that SARS-CoV-2 has left on us. And 
Some people have said, well, this represents the effect our immune system was scarred, to use kind of an analogy, by the experience that we had with that virus. Um, and when people talk about it in that way, that's kind of leaving an immune scar that's a memory effect that will be with us for the rest of our lives, it suggests that this is a one-way street and, and woe is us if we ended up in this problem because we're never gonna escape from it. Mm -hmm. um, I think the other side of the story, which is very exciting because we've seen such tremendous progress and breakthroughs being made in understanding the immune system in some respects as a consequence of all the heightened work that's being done post-COVID, is that um, these conditions, these immune scars, these bad memories from an immune event like a SARS uh, infection are to some extent reversible. Uh, we call it immune rejuvenation, whatever term you want to put on it, immune renewal or something. Uh, uh, biology is not generally a one-way street. And biology generally has two ways in the street. You can travel um, either towards uh, improving your functional status over time, or you can continually travel on the path towards increasing disability and dysfunction. Uh, and there are biological mechanisms available in our body to do either one of those. <laughs> and so to some extent, it depends on what route we want to take. And to take the route of renewal, of immune renewal, of getting rid of these scars and regenerating our immune system function, we have to do things that are probably different than what we did to get us into the problem to begin with. Because what we have learned, and I think I'm not pointing fingers at anyone, but I'm just recognizing the numbers, in terms of the health outcomes from the exposure to the SARS-CoV-2 virus, we as the United States nation did more poorly than virtually any other developed country in the world. Mm -hmm. and, and it begs the question, why would that be? Yeah. I mean, you know, we're a country with all this modern medicine and technology and and opportunities and food and so forth that other countries don't have, how in the world did we end up in worse shape? Was it bad genes? Well, no, it wasn't bad genes. I mean, we're um, a society with uh, kind of a sand pile of genes. You know, we're, we're a conglomerate of all sorts of genes. Um, so was it, in fact, we're just older as a population, we're just senile, and so we just get these diseases more frequently? No, our demographics don't say that we're, as a country, that much older than many of the other developed countries that I'm describing that have much lower prevalence of severity of COVID-19 outcomes. So then it begs the question, well, what was the status of our immune system when we started our, our, our population immune system? Yeah. Was our population immune system in optimal resilient state? No, it was not. It was set up to be more vulnerable to the SARS-CoV-2 virus that produced then a latent effect that scarred the immune system, led to this bad memory effect for which we now have some people, millions actually, yeah. who are still paying the price, even though their COVID was not that serious, yeah. that uh, they, they didn't have to be hospitalized and intubated to end up with um, long COVID or long haul COVID symptoms. Now, many of those symptoms will resolve in three months, but there is a there is a population now, and we're still new in this in this field, obviously, with data, but there are some that are still with symptoms, uh, you know, two years later after getting over the infection. So this is reminiscent to me of something I've gone through in, in my past history, having been in this field for over 40 years, which was the HIV AIDS followed by chronic fatigue syndrome period, which was the 80s moving to the early 90s, in which we, we got through the immediate uh, HIV AIDS um, issue with you know, development of new medications, but we saw growing up around that, this chronic fatigue syndrome that people call post-viral fatigue syndrome and uh, myalgic encephalitis or encephalitis. Yeah. So it had the same presentation of symptoms that we're seeing with long haul, of fatigue, cognitive dysfunction, memory loss, foggy brain, chronic pain, fibromyalgia, and at first, everyone was claiming that, and I'm now back in the early 90s, mm -hmm. people were saying, oh, it's all in the mind. There, at least it doesn't really exist. It's just people have psychological dis uh, disturbance. But now over the decades, we recognize, no, that chronic fatigue syndrome is a real entity. You can measure its effect on adverse influence on the energy producing parts of our body which are in cells called the mitochondria, which are these little energy powerhouse components of our cells that take food energy and convert it into metabolic energy. Mm -hmm. And we find that that um, chronic fatigue syndrome 
condition resulted in injury to the mitochondria in our cells that lowered our energy producing capability. So all these symptoms are related to kind of energy deficit disorder, fatigue, cognitive dysfunction, immunological disturbance. And what people don't, I think, understand is that our immune system is energetically very hungry. When it is activated, like it, trying to defend us against an infection or we're injured and we have to activate our immune system to help recover from an injury, it can use up to 50% of our metabolic energy. 50%. It's huge, it's huge, huge number. And so what happens if the cells that make up our immune system have defective energy producing machinery? Because those cells, those white blood cells are chock filled with these energy powerhouse mitochondria. So now it's not just our muscles are fatigued or our brains are fatigued, our immune system is fatigued. Yeah. And, and now our resilience is low. And what kind of things contribute to that? Well, now here is where we make the segue into cardiometabolic, because it turns out that our immune system and its function is directly tied, obviously, to our metabolism. So this is called immunometabolism, because the source of energy for our immune system is metabolism of food in the energy in the immune cell. So now immunometabolism is a field that's growing up to importance, saying if you've got bad metabolism, you have impaired immune function. Mm -hmm. Now, what is it that we know, what are some of the things that we know are clinically related to poor metabolism? Well, at the head of the list is poor blood sugar control, yeah. insulin resistance, inability to metabolize carbohydrate, mm -hmm. high blood sugar, increased A1C, which also comes with number two, chronic inflammation, yeah. increased high sensitivity CRP in our blood. Uh, this, is a pro this is a process that has been labeled inflammation, right? Mm -hmm. That we're in a chronic simmering inflammatory state that's associated with biological aging of all the cells of our body, particularly those cell types that are most energetically intensive, like the immune system. So the question is, well, does that mean that if we've had some years and birthdays, let's just choose a number, 40 years of birthdays, that our immune system could be older than our age and birthdays? And the answer is yes. We have been measuring this using a variety of new tools that are used in the, in the laboratory, finding that in some cases, people that have long COVID, their immune system, although they may be 40 on birthdays, their immune system may be equivalent to a 65-year-old. It's already losing a lot of its capability. And a lot of those people feel it, right? That's you know, we it. the people will say, I know I'm this age, but boy, do I feel older some mornings. It, exactly right. Sleep disturbedness, cognitive, cognitive dysfunction, foggy brain, just feeling like you don't have that, that zip and zap you had when you were younger, that uh, feeling of electricity. Uh, this is all an energetic deficit problem. And so blood sugar regulation and inflammation regulation are two principally important metabolic features of a, de a depreciated immune system. Now, the good news is, as we were, as I was talking about earlier, this is not a one-way street. We can turn these things around. And that's where the optimism of what you're doing with Root Cause Medicine podcast leads us into solutions away from fear. Which is a huge thing because a lot of fear has been happening, of course, the last couple of years. And a lot of people that I've talked to or people who've written it in the comment sections they're like, I just don't understand why me, like why me? And then what can I do about it? Because I've been told, unfortunately, that there's no true medication for this. Maybe here's an antidepressant, maybe here's a pain medication, depending what their long COVID symptom is, they're getting redirected to some of these medications for better or for worse, but they're like, I, I still feel like crap, or I am at the six month mark or the 12 month mark, or in some cases, the two year mark. And I'm still experiencing a lot of these symptoms and it's frustrating. And I'm sure there's something I can do that is we said in the very beginning is much more on the cutting edge. And that's why I love having you on one, because you're so positive about it. And two, because you really read the research and understand this, um, how the immune system works, inflammation, inflammation, even if somebody doesn't fully understand what inflammation is, if I say, do you feel bloated? Do you feel puffy? Do you ever feel pain? Do you get redness? Do you, you know, they're like, oh, yep. You know, they can check the box on some of those things and realize 
at least externally, they may understand what inflama- inflama- uh, inflammatory uh, process is happening, even if they can't see it necessarily on the inside. So I definitely want to go right into the positive. <laughs> Let's give people hope. <laughs> yeah. Let's help the mitochondria. And I do remember I said this to you uh, at the boot camp when the boot camp, for those who are listening, we did it with um, Dr. Elroy and Dr. Aristo Vojdani. And they had published a paper. Um, Dr. Vo- Dr. Aristo Vojdani is quite a scientist and had published a paper around SARS CoV 2 in the very beginning. And he was showing that it uh, really reacted against the mitochondria. I remember reading this paper and I thought, all right. This is in 2020. If I get COVID, because it's right in the beginning, if I get COVID, the first thing I'm going to do is protect my mitochondria because Dr. Vojdani said it's the first thing to get attacked. Let's let's protect those. And here we are in 2023 I'm talking with you, talking about metabolism, energy, and the mitochondria. And so Dr. Aristo was right. <laughs> we got to protect our and mitochondria. As he often has been over the last as he often years. has been over. Yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's a smart dude. But, and, and I just also want to say for those listening, you know, viruses are a pain in the ass, whether it's Epstein-Barr, whether it's cytomegalovirus, whether it's HIV, you know, SARS-CoV-2, viruses are a pain in the ass and they're opportunistic. I've long said this to my patients who would go, why me? Why did I get this? Why do I have, why did it reactivate whatever the virus was? I said, cause they're opportunistic bastards. Like they, they just swoop right in. They, they're not polite, you know, they're not thoughtful, like they're, they're viruses. And unfortunately this is what they do. Now we know for millions of people. So let's give hope. Yeah, you know, I think uh, you're speaking to, for me, an interesting, it's like deja vu all over again. You know, it wasn't so good the first time. Yeah. Um, this As I go back to really, in my experience from the 80s on, this has been a common objective is to try to understand better what we can do in these patients that carry this chronic burden of energy deficit throughout decades of their life. And it started off for us back uh, in the 90s. This was probably one of the most important moments in the or, um, origin of IFM because we we came up with a, with a program that we called the 4R program, mm-hmm. which stood for re, uh, Remove, Replace, Re-Inoculate, Repair. It was a gastrointestinal restoration program this was 1992 or three that we delivered that as a therapeutic approach towards people because we recognized that more than 60% of the immune system was clustered around our intestinal tract. And if we could help people to restore, this is before the microbiome became the big thing, mm-hmm. if we could restore the function of their gastrointestinal immune system, that we could eliminate a lot of downstream problems that come as it relates to immune alteration. So that became the first clinical tool that we developed. Uh, and we did a number of studies, clinical studies. I had a big clinical research uh, center at that time. We had thousands of patients go diff- through different trials. And that became a standard that many, many clinicians now use in their practice. It, it, I think it has more R's on it now than four. <laughs> but we started out with four. Remove the bad ones, uh, replace the digestive enzymes and, and pancreatic uh, uh, and uh, stomach acid. Um, re- re-inoculate with friendly uh, pre and probiotics and then repair the gastro- gastrointestinal mucosa with the appropriate nutrients like L-glutamine and, and uh, vitamin E and o- o- omega-3 EPA and so forth. Um, the next thing that we did, however, after that was that we recognized that many people sustain injury to their energy producing capability as a consequence of burdens of toxins. Mm. And this concept of of endo and exotoxicity, things that we take from the environment and even toxins produced by our gut bacteria, um, can poison our metabolism. And so we worked very, very hard in developing a program that we call metabolic detoxification, using certain plant foods that have secondary metabolites that activate our genes to produce more of these detoxifying uh, capabilities, these enzymes, cytochrome P450 and and phase two enzymes in our body that detoxify foreign chemicals. And that program then became kind of our second level in IFM to develop a clinical tool that could be taught to clinicians as to how to do that in practice. And I'm very pleased to say that has become very prominent now in many, many different um, clinics. Then the third thing which followed from that was in, I think, 1996 or seven, was when we started to really dig in deep and understanding 
uh, mitochondrial bioenergetics, how these little organelles and cells, the mitochondria, these energy furnaces, how they actually produce their energy and how their energy gets interrupted through toxins and, and immune dysfunction and, and, um, and how you might restore it. So that led to a program that we call mitochondrial resuscitation. And we did that with Dr. Paul Cheney, who, um, MD, PhD, who is one of the world's experts in chronic fatigue syndrome uh, in his uh, clinic in uh, Georgia. And, and that led us to do a variety of studies in which we found that there were certain nutrients and a certain dietary approach that we could take towards re-energizing mitochondrial capability because the mitochondria in cells can actually reproduce themselves and replace themselves even when the cell doesn't. It has its own ability, it has its own DNA, and it's capable of actually reforming a new mitochondria through the process of mitophagy um, when the cell is not being replaced. So that was another part of the renewal of the bioenergetic machinery that we developed. Now the fourth step, and, and for me probably the, the last uh, of this, this four different approaches, is what I'm calling immunorejuvenation. Once we activate the gut properly and get the microbiome to be healthy, and we pro have proper detoxification, and we focus on a rejuvenation, re resuscitation of mitochondria, then let's make sure our immune system is rejuvenating itself. And that's the fourth pillar in this four, uh, I think, uh, clinical tools that are used by practitioners in, in our field, in your field. And I, I'm very proud of this because these are four things in our field that we have developed. These are clinical tools that can go in medical textbooks that can be taught to practitioners to do that you will not find in any other traditional textbooks of medicine that are treating disease. Yeah. They are a product of our own field's uh, innovation and, and now over decades, clinical proof of concept by actually doing it with people in practice. And it, for me, it's the most, uh, it, it's my greatest pride to see how this has actually filtered its way into our field uh, successfully. Oh, successfully a hundred times over. I mean, I think for people listening, they will, if they're on social media at all, they will recognize pieces and parts of that, the forest system you were mentioning, um, through, you know, Instagram posts and stories and, and Facebook and TikTok, where people have taken pieces of these and they're are trying to educate and explain. And now for everyone listening here, they, you know, they heard it maybe for, for the first time ever, this was Dr. Bland and IFM in the 1990s. We are in 2023. This is in the 1990s. Some of you might not have even been born yet. I'm um, creating these protocols. And the other thing that I that I love and I want to you know really focus on is that in the fourth steps that you talked about, um, the gut health, the toxins, you know, detox, the mitochondrial resuscitation, and immune rejuvenation. Um, it might sound head spinning if you're hearing this for the first time, or you might think, oh, that's unachievable. I can't do that. I don't know what that means. But I want to assure you as somebody who has been in this field, I've been in this field since 1999. So I was at the tail end of the nineties um, where I started. Uh, it, it is achievable and it is doable. And it is um, in a lot of cases, it does fit in the budget. You know, there are definitely some of it's expensive and some of it's free, cheap, and easy. And, you know, there's there's quite the gamut in between. And so I love that it gives people a lot of hope. Whereas even if they listen to this and not sure where to start, there's an entire organization of trained practitioners who who know what to do, know where to start. And that this is when you're scrolling through social media, when you should be in bed, um, and you come across these posts about gut health, or toxins, or the mitochondria, or the immune system and infl uh, inflammation. This is what he's talking about, tying it all together. So I really appreciate, one, the history lesson, um, and two, again, the hope where people go, gosh, no one's talked to me about my gut. No one's talked to me about my mitochondria. Like I wasn't offered anything for, for you know, nobody told me about toxins. I, I didn't realize that those could be a problem. And the thing with mitochondria is, and I, I love that you in, in the program, and I'll say this and then let you let you talk. The um, you know, there's there's a method to madness, and mitochondria are like the canary in the coal mine. They're very dramatic, right? They're like fainting goats. You blow at them and they just faint and fall over. That's your mitochondria. But we need that immediate feedback, and they're very reactive to toxins. So instead of trying to resuscitate a mitochondria first and foremost, the first step is the gut, which plays a big role. Second step is remove the toxins. So it's when we're, if you think of like, a, you know, like a funnel effect, it's, it's the greatest impact all the way down 
to, okay, now we're getting to the nitty gritty and gut to toxins. The order is, the order is quite important. And then the mitochondria and then immune resuscitation. Yeah, beautifully stated. Uh, I think that this, um, as you said, I think very well, it sounds very highbrow, very sophisticated, maybe very techno speak, but when it delivers down into what that means in a person's daily living, it's not that complicated. Mm -hmm. The dietary changes, the lifestyle changes, uh, you know, things like time restricted feeding or things like uh, sleep hygiene yeah. or things like uh, regular activity or things like eating by the rainbow. Uh, you know, these are all things that are sensible when they're put into action. They're only as good as, as people doing them. Mm -hmm. But I can assure people that when they are done, they will pro provide dividends in return. Yeah. Um, it, it's amazing. I, I, I happened to make a statement in a recent podcast, and, and maybe I overspoke at the time. Someone asked me what, for me, was the most... Um, satisfying feedback I've gotten from the years I've been in the field. And I said that for me, I have had the, oh boy, I, I, it's more than grace, pleasure, or gratitude. It, it's almost overwhelming uh, feeling of, of gratitude when people have come up to me quite frequently over the years and said, Dr. Bland, we want to thank you for saving my life or my mm -hmm. spouse's wife or my partner's wife or my sister's wife or, you know, and I'm thinking to myself, now hold on, you know, um, that's very gracious of them to say that, but that seems like an exaggeration. I've never done surgery. I'm, I'm not doing chemotherapy. I, I'm providing information about people's self-regulation and trying to instruct how it could be implemented. But what I come to recognize is that the power that changes people's life starts with words and it starts with intention. And then it starts into action. It goes into action. Mm -hmm. And so it was just a couple of weeks ago that I happened to mention that for me, the most gratifying thing that I, I'm not even sure at times that I deserve, when people have come up and said that to me, I take that very seriously. So when I said this in this podcast a couple of weeks or a few weeks ago, I then had two people email me back saying, you know, Dr. Bland, I haven't uh, talked to you for a long time or I haven't seen you or so forth. But I want you to know that what you said about saving lives is exactly right. Because again, you saved my life and they went through their experience. Now, what that really tells me is that sometimes what we think is unapproachable un, uh, because it sounds so sophisticated and so complicated, when it's distilled down to a practitioner such as yourself, the skill in the art that you can communicate it effectively, you get a person to understand and to implement it in their lives. The, the the return on investment of time and energy for that person is huge. Yeah, and I won't even talk about well, it might save you from going to the hospital. I, even those are kind of hard to know what you prevented, but we do know how we feel every day when we wake up. That's yeah. an immediate uh, value proposition. And the number of people that have you know really hundreds of people that have spoken to me saying you gave back my energy, mm -hmm. you gave back my enthusiasm, you gave back my clarity of mind. You gave my, back my ability to do things that I thought I had lost before. Those are really huge examples of what we're talking about in terms of root cause medical intervention. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I see it, um, again, I'm on social media quite a bit, so I see it in the comments. I see it in the, in the DMs where people, we don't get great education around basic health, self-care, how our bodies work really in school. You know, we, we get like the basics around how to get pregnant. So don't do that in middle school, you know, in high school, we get the basics around maybe some, you know, the food pyramid and nutrition. And after that, it's kind of a disaster. And so to, to see people's comments and DMS and, and all sorts of our colleagues, posts where they say, I didn't know that I didn't know the synthetic fragrance and candles that I have all over my house could be affecting my hormones. And as a result, I have now gotten rid of them. And honest to God, my headaches are gone. Like I did not realize that was a problem. I have other people in women health practitioner posts say, I didn't realize the scent and the dye in, let's say tampons was affecting my endometriosis and my cramps. And I switched to hundred percent natural cotton or, you know, maybe a diva cup and it's lessened my cramps, my endometriosis pain, 50%, which for anyone who's experienced endometriosis cramps, 50% is a Hail Mary. 
And, and I see these things all the time where pe- people just don't know. And to be able to listen to this today, they go, all right, gut health, reduce toxins. Let's focus on the mitochondria and get that immune system up and going again. That is, is some, is somebody that's only four steps, not a problem. <laughs> Well, I can do that. <laughs> let, let's let's segue from that into showing them maybe how these this upstream approach or this root cause approach has downstream benefits. Because yes. let, I'd like to talk just for a, a brief moment about one of the other side effects of post COVID, mm-hmm. other than the pulmonary effects on respiration and breathing and energy and, and cognitive dysfunction like uh, brain fog. We also have this cardiac effect. We're starting to see people who have problems with heart rhythms and people with uh, ejection fractions that are lower and uh, coagulation disorders, throwing clots. So um, how does this relate to cardiac function? And here is a really interesting, I think, example of, again, how immune metabolism is connected throughout the body to different organ systems. So when I first started off a lot of years ago that I won't even talk about <laughs> in this field, uh, it was thought that heart disease was a consequence, it was a cholesterol problem. And it was, if you ate a lot of cholesterol and saturated fat, it would clog up your arteries because it would just form gum in the pipes and that was heart disease. I'm making it a simple story here to make a point. Uh, but the cholesterol hypothesis was the dominant hypothesis that kind of ruled the cardiology world. Over time, however, it's uh, it's become clear that that is only a part of the story and probably not even the principal part of the story. The principal part of the story is that people that have heart disease have inflammatory conditions of their coronary arteries and their vessels that uh, try conduct blood uh, and the immune system cells throughout the body. And so it's an inflammatory issue. Yeah. And what is it? Where is inflammation? It's your immune system. So it's a connection of the immune system to metabolism to your heart and yeah. your arteries. And so now it's like, whoa, just a minute. That's a whole different thinking. I didn't know that cardiometabolic disease could be related to immune inflammation and the things that are connected to why I'm not breathing right and why I'm low energy and fatigue. Yeah. And all these things have central mechanisms that present themselves into different organs with different symptoms. And so if we start talking about cardiometabolic disease in the age of this 21st century perspective, then we have to bring inflammation, the immune system into the story, as well as things that we talked about, like glucose and control of blood sugar and control of allergies and infectious things and control of toxins, because they play just roles there as they do in these other conditions. So we're very excited that we're going to be doing this um, this meeting, um, big conclave in Chicago, on April 21st and 2nd, with uh, really seven of uh, I call key opinion leaders on this topic that bring different perspectives uh, to bear on how cardiometabolic disease needs to be reframed as more than just cholesterol. <laughs> <laughs> Amen to that. Yeah. It's yeah, no, I'm excited. Um, so for all the practitioners that are listening, it is, it is a for practitioners, all practitioners, um, April 21st and 22nd, the cardiometabolic symposium with PLMI personalized lifestyle medicine Institute and orthomolecular. Um, and when Dr. Bland said it is cutting edge key opinion leaders who are speaking, he's not kidding. Like I said, I went to all three last year and, um, it was things you're not typically going to hear. Uh, maybe in, in the day-to-day, or maybe you've been taught before, which I always find really exciting. And I'm uh, thrilled, honestly, because of all the outcomes of COVID and because honestly, it's cardiometabolic syndrome that ultimately is what's the number one killer of humans. You know, heart disease doesn't matter male or female. And in fact, I just read a statistic the other day, I believe it was on the CDC website, NIH, no, CDC website, I believe, that like 20 to 30% of adult Americans have non-alcoholic, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Fatty liver disease, you know? I mean, it's just, this, these things are just endemic, unfortunately, you know? And it's, there's, it's important that we educate. You've been at the forefront of it from the very beginning. And um, especially now around COVID, we have to teach 
get on the cutting edge and inspire hope because unfortunately we've seen some really tough cardio metabolic outcomes. Yeah. People have lost people because of mm -hmm. them, unfortunately. Absolutely. Well, you know, let, let me, uh, if, if I can, just take a moment to talk about part of why this word hope I think is so important because a lot of us have become disillusioned maybe or depressed yeah. or filled with anxiety and feeling like we don't have any control. We're just victims. And once you get into a victim space, it's really, really a complicated uh, psychology to be in because you feel like you have no escape. And yeah. uh, so this concept of hope is really important. And I want to go back. I hope this will bear on some hope. Um, so in my professional lifetime, uh, I was involved in the uh, in the 1960s. I know that sounds like ancient history. It probably was uh, with the McGovern Committee that was uh, dietary goals for the United States. And it was trying to determine what kind of diet uh, Senator McGovern from Dakotas was uh, trying to get us to understand uh, what um, diet might be best to improve the health of the population mm -hmm. of the United States. Mm -hmm. And through that committee, um, ultimately came the dietary goals in the United States. It were published, I think, in 1981, if I'm not mistaken, uh, several years after the committee had finished its work. And one of the things that they said, one of the principal goals was to reduce fat in the diet, particularly saturated fat. That was a principal uh, takeaway that they said fat was a contributor to killing people due to heart disease. Mm. Um, now, the way that got translated by the food industry was to say, okay, good. If we take expensive fat out of food, then what do we want to replace it with? Because you mm. still have to sum up to 100% of the calories. you got to fill something with those you took out. So let's fill it in with highly refined carbohydrate and high fructose corn syrup sweeteners and sucrose. Mm. Let's use sugar and highly processed starch as a filler. By the way, that's really inexpensive. So we like it because it'll make our products even more profitable. So with that government uh, recommendation came a complete change in the American food supply. We never heard about high fructose corn syrup sweeteners until after the McGovern report. Then it wow. suddenly was converting corn fields in Iowa and Nebraska into fructose uh, producing factories. And the, the, the foods got filled with those, particularly soft drinks that went from an eight ounce serving to now a serving big enough that you could hold the Olympic swimming trials in. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. and so suddenly people were overwhelmed with simple carbohydrate. Mm -hmm. And what did that do? When I was early on in my, when I was in medical school in the sixties, we didn't even know what metabolic syndrome was because it hadn't been talked about yet. Carol Reben, who came up with the concept of syndrome X wasn't until the seventies. And then we suddenly see post the McGovern committee recommendations being implemented by the food industry into simple carbohydrate sugar rich foods that we had reports of more than 27% of the adult population having insulin resistance yeah. and, and, and metabolic syndrome. And it was an epidemic proportion that did what? It drove people into type two diabetes that went from 3% of the population to nearly 10% of the population over those years. Yeah. It became a, a pandemic of its own. And what happened with the drug industry? It flourished on the production of insulin managing drugs for glucose tolerance problems and diabetes. It built their citadel of new therapeutic high profit tools for the treatment of the dietary outcomes from the perversion of the dietary goals. Then for the first time in my life in the 1990s, we had reports of juveniles yeah. starting to be seen, these are adolescents, having non-alcoholic fatty liver syndrome. Never before had that ever been seen in medicine because they were the, the test people in this uncontrolled scientific test of a bad diet, high in sugar and fructose, what it would do to the livers of children. And lastly then, as we develop the new anti-hepatitis drugs, we find that the most singular significant reason for the epidemic or need of liver transplants is due to fatty liver disease. Hmm. It is the single cause. It's, it's exceeded that of hepatitis 
as the single cause for the need, the, or the predominant cause for liver transplant. So when you put all this together, now you say, what's the good news? Because that sounds like a pretty bleak picture. The good news is that we had an awakening within the last 10 years to say, holy moly, this experiment we did on people was a tragic mistake. Yeah. And we need to turn this back around. And we don't turn it around by just getting more drugs for treating non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or diabetes. We turn it around by the things that you and our field have been talking about since time memoriam. That's how you change the equation. It's not new drugs. It's using the rule of reasonableness of things that we've been trying to get people to understand yeah. for decades. Yeah. So that that's the good news. We have the tools. You know, a friend of mine said to me not too long ago, he said, Jeff, people are dying to know what we know. They're dying to know what we know. It, it's kind of a, yeah. you know, a double meaning, isn't it? Yeah, it sure is. And uh, I think that literally that is correct. Mm -hmm. That is absolutely correct. It's not just figuratively, it's literally. Yeah, which is why you have been just again the godfather of functional medicine one of the main originals with institute for functional medicine starting plmi and so 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 much more uh for those listening this past summer when i was in the chicago symposium i happened to be in the back of a car with dr bland and he was just talking about all i thought someday i hope somebody records your entire story from start to finish with all of the things you had done and the committees you had been a part of and just grand, grand things you have, you know, you have touched and made an impact on because it was mind blowing to me. I, I thought I knew some about you. And of course it turned out, I know I, you've just, again, just touched so many wonderful parts of the world to try to make it a better place. And so I'm really deeply honored to have you on the podcast today to talk about this and really to inspire people. Well, thank you. I think that we are involved in a in a collective inspiration movement right now. And that's why I think there is hope. Um, because it's only through the the goodness, the pursuit of goodness in people collectively that we can change this equation. Um, you know, we can look at our present situation and say, woe is us, or we can look at our present situation and say, look what we've learned and let's help our next generation to take these lessons and not reproduce them. Yeah. And and to look at, because there are solutions. It's not that we say, well, these are all the problems but we don't know what to do. We actually do know what to do. <laughs> we just yeah. have to start doing it. <laughs> yes, and again, amen to that. And for those listening, Dr. Bland, let everybody know, especially for the practitioners who are interested in the symposium, where can they go to learn more? Yes, thank you. I think if they go to our uh, PLMI website, I think it's a really good site, a source. You can see all the speakers, the topics, um, it, we actually also have uh, downloadable content, including Dr. Kerry Jones, of things that we've done in the past <laughs> that you can find there uh, that are free of charge. So that's uh, our, um, you can either Google PLMI or our specific URL is plminstitute.org. PLMinstitute.org. Well, again, just from the bottom of my heart, thank you very much for being on the Root Cause Medicine podcast today inspiring hope and continuing to educate your passion just comes through and I appreciate it. Well, likewise, I turn the uh, finger right back to you and say, thank you for all you're doing. We need uh, the people that have taken the baton that will run this race and keep uh, moving towards the fin I don't think it's a finish line. It's really <laughs> turning the, the evolution of our culture and, and you're, you're one of those, uh, those select people. So thank you. Oh, thank you.